This video contains examples about hearing loss, dating, and belief in fake news. There is reference to hidden satanic messages in pop songs that shouldn't be taken seriously or as an endorsement of an ideology. I use a curse word that rhymes with model fit. There is a child. Hello, today we're going to talk about how we can tell how well our model fits our data and we're also going to look at extending the linear model to include more than one predictor. So we've seen this diagram lots and lots of times before, it just outlines the process that scientists go through. So they'll begin with a scientific question, something they're interested in answering, and having worked out what variables they want to measure, they'll then measure those variables in a sample, and having collected data in a sample, they'll visualize those data and then fit a model. We've seen in previous lectures that fitting a model involves estimating parameters, so these are represented by Bs, uh, not the buzzy kind. Um, so uh, you can estimate parameters, which is like estimating the effect that you're interested in. You can estimate those as a single value or as an interval of sort of potential values. And we can also hypothesis test by using those parameters and um, comparing them to a particular value, which is normally zero. So you're interested in is the parameter significantly different from zero. So today we're gonna just continue with this kind of middle part but we're going to kind of focus back on the model overall predominantly and have a look at how we assess how well it fits. So by the end of today, we're going to have some kind of understanding of how we establish the fit of a general linear model. Uh, so we're going to look at sums of squares. We're going to look at mean squares, the F statistic and R squared, an exciting list of statistics if ever I saw one. And um, then in the second half, we'll have a look at how we can incorporate several predictors into the general linear model. And we'll do that by looking at what the model actually looks like as an equation, what it looks like visually to some extent. But mostly, we're going to focus on how we would enter multiple predictors into a model, so different methods you can use, and interpretation, so how we interpret parameters, where the Bs, when we have um, several predictors. Okay, so just to recap uh, previous lectures, the general linear model, as we've seen, is, um, or, and as we will see, is a versatile framework for analyzing data. Uh, it's based on the very simple idea of predicting an outcome from some kind of model that varies in its complexity and can expand and contract to become more or less complex and that there will always be error in prediction. And we've also seen that the form of the model is to have variables, an outcome variable and predictor variables. And predictor variables have parameters associated with them, these Bs. So uh, the parameters tell us, in the case of a parameter or a B that's attached to a predictor, it tells us something about the relationship between that predictor and the outcome. So it basically tells us about the, you know, the effect of that predictor. And in terms of uh, beta zero, there's more often than not uh, what, you know, a constant or intercept in this model, which tells us the value of the outcome when all our predictors are zero. We've uh, used this example in lots of previous lectures about predicting how long your ears ring for um, as a function of the volume of a concert you went to. And we've seen this uh, represents a linear model, one example of a linear model. And we saw, for example, that the beta attached to the predictor, so the beta attached to the volume of the concert, represents this kind of um, change in um, ear ringing. So it's basically telling us the rate of change of ear ringing as concert volume goes up. So as concert volume goes up along the x-axis, how rapidly uh, does uh, ear ringing change? We've also seen that, uh, so we had to kind of like zoom out a little bit to go beyond our data that if we stretch this model right the way back until the volume of the concert is zero, so no decibels at the concert, then our predicted value of ears ringing is beta zero. So that tells us that the predicted uh, length of time that your ears will ring for when the concert is completely silent. We also saw that that value turns out in this for these data to be a minus number, which kind of illustrates that these are estimates and because a minus amount of time for ear ringing is kind of a ridiculous value. We also saw that when our predictor variable represents groups of people, 
um, we still fit the same kind of linear model. So we can have a predictor variable that is categorical. Um, but in this case, beta zero is going to represent a mean of one of the groups. We'll cover this in a later lecture, ex exactly what that beta zero represents, but it represents the mean of uh, one of the groups. And that the beta one, so the beta attached to the predictor will represent the difference between the means of the two groups. Okay, so this is all well and good, but having fitted our model, having estimated the parameters, it's good to get some idea of whether the models are good fit. So in one of the previous lectures, we talked about um, architects building models of their of uh, bridges, and then um, and that those models could be like a good fit of reality or a poor fit of reality, and you know the extent to which you would want to trust your model before you go off and build your full scale bridge is gonna be a function of you know, how good a fit the model is to reality. So in the case of an architect, you want your model to kind of almost exactly represent the structural aspects of your real bridge so that you can trust that when it scales up to the real bridge, uh, you know, ev every test that you've done on the, on, the, on the model bridge is gonna kind of uh, replicate in the, in the main bridge. And it's a bit the same with statistical models. We want to get some idea of how well our model fits the data and uh, you know, how well it's going to kind of generalize beyond the particular sample that we have. So the first half of today is all about looking at fit. How do we tell how well the model fits the data? So we're going to begin by looking at a really simple model, kind of the simplest model that we could have. And that is the mean. So imagine we had no predictors and we're just using the, the intercept basically. So um, how well does the mean fit the data as uh, you know, a kind of a predictor of an outcome? And how, how can we think about testing whether the mean is a good fit? We're going to do this with some help from Taylor Swift and her album 1989, which to be perfectly honest, I know nothing about uh, other than according to Google, it has her biggest hit on Shake It Off. Or something like I don't know. I don't know what it's called really. I, look, I googled this the other day, and now it's completely gone out of my brain. Uh, anyway, she had a big hit apparently on this album. Um, so I don't listen to this kind of music. I'm more of a heavy metal kind of kind of person. Um, but in some desperate attempt to win favour with people who might know something about popular culture, I've chosen Taylor Swift as an example. Who, um, <laughs> depending on where you're watching this, may or may not still be relevant. But it's probably more relevant than most of the bands that I listen to that you wouldn't have even heard of. So anyway, it turns out if you um, if you go to the uh, streaming service Spotify, they produce various measures of song content. So they have lots of data about. I mean, obviously they have data about how often songs are played and things like that. But they also have some measures. And uh, to give some examples of these measures, they've got for every song on Spotify an energy measure. Uh, which is a measure from zero to one that represents uh, the kind of intensity and activity of a song. Um, they've got measures of valence, so how kind of positive or negative this, the song is, and also danceability, so uh, you know, based on their algorithm, how danceable is the track. We're gonna just focus on the energy variable, so how energetic is, uh, is each track. And it just so turn, uh, it happens to turn out there's a package in R called Spotify, which um, if you get into R, this is a re this can be a real wormhole. You can do some really cool stuff with Spotify R because basically what it does is it allows you to go and like scrape loads of data from Spotify. So there you go. So here we have uh, Taylor Swift's album uh, 1989. And we've got energy levels on the y-axis, so energy, you know, the energy uh, value of the song, and we've got the track numbers along the bottom. So there were 13 tracks on this album, and on average, the energy levels are 0.7, so fairly high. We don't particularly care what that value is. What we care about is, is that value a good fit? So if you were to make a prediction about the energy levels of a particular track, is the mean a good fit? Uh, kind of score to use. So how accurate is it going to be as a predictive value? Now when I was putting together this example I made a quite an interesting discovery because 
Um, as, I, as I mentioned, I really like heavy metal music and um, historically, um, society tends to like to blame heavy metal music for everything that's wrong in the world. I mean, it's not just heavy metal music that it blames, but that's one of the things. So for example, when I was growing up, there was a very, very famous court case in America where someone took um, the, the heavy metal band Judas Priest to court claiming that they had backward messages on their albums and that um, in this particular case this backward message had um, caused someone to uh, try to take their own life. So it's a big court case um, and Judas Priest won the court case. There, I, there was no backwards message and no kind of evidence for it but it was it was very interesting because they had you know reversed one of their tracks and and amongst all the kind of you know, static and gobbledygook that you get when you reverse the track, they claimed they could hear a message. When this was all going on, I always thought it was kind of interesting that they never kind of had any kind of control comparison. So they would just take like the Judas Priest track and reverse it and say, oh, look, listen, if you listen really carefully, you can hear this kind of message. But they never took like other tracks and also reverse them to see, can you also find messages in them? So I had to go with um, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift to see whether in kind of more, more mainstream culture uh, there were backward messages. And I think I found one. So I think I think it says, worship Satan for he is your dark lord and master. Sacrifice goats to Beelzebub, you know you want to. See what you think. Worship Satan for he is your dark lord and master. Sacrifice goats to Beelzebub, you know you want to. Hmm, interesting. Anyway, here are the energy levels for each of the 13 tracks on Taylor Swift's album. And as you can see, the mean sits in the middle of them. And the question we're interested in is, is the mean a good fit? Now you can see that for some scores, the mean is a very good fit. The dots are quite close to the line, but for other tracks, the mean is not a good fit. For example, track 13, the mean very much overestimates the energy levels. In fact, it kind of looks like Taylor's going a bit more low key as the album kind of kind of trails off. Because if you look at tracks 9, 10, 11 and 13, they all have energy levels kind of below the mean. And it's especially tracks 11 and 13, which obviously like aiming for like a low key end to the album or something. So is this a good fit? How can we tell whether this mean is a good fit? How do we quantify this? Well, in fact, we already have a clue from a previous lecture. In a previous lecture, when we looked at least squares estimation, we saw that we can take the differences between observed scores and predicted scores and square them and add them up to get a sum of squares. And we can do exactly the same thing here. If we want to know how much error in prediction there is, we do the same thing that uh, effectively is happening when we work out the least squares estimator. So we know that the mean is going to be the value that minimizes the least squared, uh, sorry, it minimizes the sum of squared errors. The question is how big is that sum? And if that sum is very big, that indicates perhaps that the mean isn't a good fit. So that's precisely what we can do. We can just take the differences between each score and the predicted value, the mean, uh, and square them and add them up. And in this case, we get a sum of 0.26. It's small because all the all the energy scores are small. They have to be less than one or between zero and one. So great, but does this actually tell us anything? I mean, how do we interpret this kind of total error? Well, just we're gonna use a kind of a, a something as a frame of reference, right? Just to give us a flavor for what sums of squares might tell us. And we're gonna compare Taylor Swift's album with the greatest album ever written, which is Iron Maiden's Peace of Mind. So here's Iron Maiden's Peace of Mind. 
this uh, the blue line or the you know horizontal line is the average energy levels of the tracks which is 0.9 that's higher than Taylor Swift's album which you'd kind of expect because you know heavy metal bands tend to write you know fast and energetic songs we're not interested in that difference it doesn't matter to us what we're interested in is how representative the mean is so here are the individual energy levels of the songs on Peace of Mind. There's only nine tracks on Peace of Mind. And you can see these do hover very, very close to the mean. If you compare the distances between the dots and the line for Iron Maiden and the dots and the line for Taylor Swift, hopefully you can see the dots are much closer to the line for Iron Maiden. And when we do that same process of working out the, um, the difference between the dots and the line and squaring them, and adding all of those values up, we get a value of 0 0.02, which is much smaller than the value for Taylor Swift, which does at face value suggest that there is less error in prediction for uh, the Iron Maiden album when we use the mean than for Taylor Swift's album. But there is an issue here in that Taylor Swift's album is based on thir has 13 tracks and Iron Maiden's album only has nine. So Taylor Swift's sum is based on 13 scores, Iron Maiden's sum is only based on 9, so we can't directly compare them. So sums of squares represent total error, and because they're totals we can't compare them directly unless they were based on the same number of scores. So more often than not, if we are in a scenario where we want to compare sums of squares, rather than using sums or totals, we factor in the number of scores that were used to calculate the sum of squares. So basically, we can take something that you can think of as like an average error. So rather than a total error, an average error. So that's just gonna be like the total error divided by some function of the number of scores that were used. So we could just use the number of scores to get an actual average, but what we end up using is something known as the degrees of freedom. And you can think of this as the number of independent pieces of information that were used to compute the sum of squares. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, essentially, every time we estimate a parameter, we lose a piece of independent information. So the degrees of freedom, broadly speaking, are just the, the number of scores minus the number of parameters we were estimating. So in, the, in this case, where we're just using a mean, we're only estimating one parameter, which is the mean. So um, n minus p becomes n minus one. So we can work out what's known as a mean squared. It's just the kind of the average squared error by dividing the sum of squares by, in this case, n minus one, or more generally, the degrees of freedom. All this is trying to illustrate is just that we can't compare totals. So we, we, we quite often work with mean squares rather than sums of squares, because then we can compare them. So in the case of uh, Iron Maiden and Taylor Swift, if we look at the mean squared error rather than the sum of squared error, we can compare these two values. We still see that the, the, the mean squared error for Iron Maiden is much smaller than for Taylor Swift, which is what you would expect because hopefully what you can see here quite clearly is that the dots for Iron Maiden are very much closer to the uh, predicted value, to the mean value of 0.9. So in terms of using the average to tell you something about the album in general, the mean is a better fit for the Iron Maiden album than the Taylor Swift album. So if you say to, to someone, you know, on average, the tracks on Peace of Mind have energy levels of 0.9, any track they choose, that's going to be a pretty good predictor of how energetic it is. In other words, there's a lot of consistency in the energy levels on that album. Whereas for Taylor Swift, if you say, well, on average, uh, the, the tracks have energy levels of 0.7, it's not as representative because actually what's there's a lot more kind of variability in energy levels. Some of the tracks are very high energy and some of them are kind of quite low energy. So if you were using that to make a decision about buying the album and you wanted something that was sort of consistently high energy, then for Taylor Swift that means not really giving you a very accurate picture because you're, you're going to get to the end of the album and realise that you know there's actually some low energy songs on there. We're going to switch example to talk about the illusory truth effect and this is the idea that if you repeat something then its perceived truthfulness will increase. It's quite an old effect, it's been found to be true in both plausible and implausible statements so even if you're saying something fairly implausible if you repeat it enough times 
then um, people will start to believe it. This is a public service announcement. Andy's lectures are amazing. 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 Thank you. Now, of course, this has lots of implications politically um, because uh, it's also true of political statements as well. Now, if you look at um, US President Donald Trump in between the years of 2016 and 2019, 73% um, of the statements he made were only half true or worse. So, you know, lots of um, inaccuracies, let's say. But if you repeat those inaccuracies enough time, people start to believe them. And this has been looked at experimentally, where people have been exposed repeatedly to Donald Trump's statements and rated how truthful they thought they were on um, a six point scale. And repetition has a a relationship to how truthful they think they are. So we're going to use some actual data from one of these studies and I want you to uh, imagine, or not imagine because we have the data, uh, we're using a model that predicts ratings of truthfulness of fake statements from the number of times the person was exposed to those statements. So our predictor is the number of exposures, how many times it was the statement was repeated and the outcome is the uh, perception of truth from zero definitely false to five definitely true. So how would we test the fit of this model? How would we see if this model was a reasonable fit of the observed data? Now, just like we did with the mean, we can use sums of squared errors, but we use different types of sums of squared errors. So in particular, there are three that we will you know, use in different ways. So the first is the total sum of squares. So this is the total variability in outcome scores, the total variability or total error in prediction from using just the intercept, from using just the mean. This gives us some idea of kind of the variability in the outcome, or in this case, in perceptions of truth. We can look at something called the residual sum of squares, and this is how much error there is in prediction from the model itself. So in other words, it's kind of how badly the model fits in total. And we can also look at something called a model sum of squares, and this looks at how much better the model is at predicting the outcome than the mean was. So in other words, it's kind of like how well the model fits in total. So we'll have a look at how each of these is calculated. Effectively, what we're doing here is if you imagine the kind of uh, the variability in the outcome, the variability in these sort of perceptions of truth is kind of like a, a cheesecake, a big cheesecake. We're kind of slicing that cheesecake into two. So the total sum of squares gets divided up or subdivided into two portions. One portion is how kind of how much better we can predict the outcome as a result of using our model. And the second is how much error in prediction there is still left over. So here's the model, uh, or here's a version of the model, because um, you know I'm trying to keep to a small number of scores. So the model is perce uh, perceived truth being predicted from repetition, number of repetitions of a statement. So there's going to be betas attached to repetition. There's going to be um, a, an intercept, a beta zero, that tells us the kind of perception of truth when there are no repetitions. And you can see if you fit the model, the betas have values of 1.28 and 0.54. And the graphic just shows you what the model kind of looks like. So to start off with, we want to work out the total sum of squared error. So the, the kind of like total variability in the outcome. So to do this, we start off by effectively sort of fitting a baseline model, if you like, which is the overall mean, which is about 3.4. And this represents a kind of a null model, if you like, because it's it's a flat line. So as number of repetitions changes, perceived truth does not change at all. So it's like fitting a kind of baseline model, if you like. And just like we've done in previous weeks to work out sums of squares, you could construct a table something like this. So you've got for each person, how many repetitions they had, you've got their truth score. So that these two columns are the observed data. We've got the predicted value of the outcome, which is the same for everyone because we're just using the mean perceived truth, which is 3.4. And then we can work out the errors, so the differences between the uh, 
actual truth rating that the person gave and the predicted value of 3.4. So that's the kind of hashed lines on the diagram. And then we can square those errors and add them up. The numbers here are not particularly important as long as you understand the process that we're looking at those distances, squaring them and adding them up. So in total, we end up with a value of 22.4. So ba basically that's how much error in prediction there is to start off with before we've entered a predictor into the model. Now this has an associated degrees of freedom with it. So we talked about this before. So we need to, uh, or we might want to at some point, well, we will want to <laughs> um, kind of balance this sum of squares out for the number of scores that have been used to calculate it. So to begin with, we have n pieces of inf uh, independent information. We've got n scores, which is 10. We've got 10 scores here. And for every parameter we estimate, we lose one piece of independent information. Now, when we're looking at the total sum of squares, we're estimating one parameter which is you know, the mean perceived truth. So for SST, because we estimate one parameter, our degrees of freedom become 10 minus one or nine. We're gonna use this score later. We can also look at fitting our model. So rather than using the mean, we fit our actual model. So we estimate the parameters to, to get the, uh, you know, the, the kind of optimal or you know, values of the parameters that have the least squared error. And that gives us a model, which is the diagonal line here. And we can now look at how much error there is in prediction when we use that model. And we do it in exactly the same way, except now we're looking at differences between each observed value and the value predicted by the diagonal line. So again, we've got a column, which is the number of repetitions each person had and their truth score. So those two columns are the observed data. But now the predicted value of y is the value predicted by the diagonal line. So for this person here who had one repetition, their predicted value is this value here, which is just under two, and their observed value was zero. So again, we can work out these errors Again, we wouldn't do this manually, a computer will be doing this for us, but we work out those values, we square those values because some of them are positive and some of them are negative, and then we can add them up. And that gives us a value of nine. So there's in total, the sum of squared, uh, sorry, the residual sum of squared errors is about nine. This too has an associated degrees of freedom. So to begin with, again, we have n pieces of independent information. So we had we have uh, 10 scores in this case, but to get this, this diagonal line, we had to estimate two parameters. We had to estimate beta zero and beta one. So we've lost two pieces of independent information by estimating those parameters, which means that the degrees of freedom is gonna be eight, 10 minus two. Finally, we could look at the model sum of squared errors. So here we've got our kind of line of best fit or our, you know, our model that minimizes error given the data. Uh, and we've got a, a kind of a flat line, almost like a null model. So the overall mean of perceived truth. So we could ask the question of what's the difference between those two values. So we ignore the observed data and instead we say, what's the difference between the overall mean perceived truth and the value predicted by the model that we've ended up fitting. So in other words, how much improvement has there been? And what this is gonna do is this gives us a kind of a, an estimate of how, in a way, how much that flat line has kind of changed really. But it's telling us the sort of reduction in error as a result of using uh, our model instead of just using the mean of the outcome. So it's the same process. We're just looking at differences between uh, the overall mean of the outcome and the values predicted by our model. So we're looking at the differences between those two columns. Some of them will be negative, some of them will be positive. So we square them and then we add up those squared values and get a value of about 3.4. 
13. Again, we need to think about the uh, degrees of freedom. And the model that we end up fitting is basically a, uh, a kind of a rotation of the null model. So you flatline, you know, you rotate it to get a slope. So we can look at the degrees of freedom as just being the difference between the total degrees of freedom and the residual degrees of freedom. Which So the two degrees of freedom that we worked out before gives us 9 minus 8 or 1. And that, if you think about it, makes sense because what that means is that the null model, the flat model, and the slope are distinguished by one piece of independent information. And that one piece of information is uh, the, basically the slope beta 1. So it, you know, hopefully that makes some kind of intuitive sense. So just to reiterate, what we've done here is we've worked out three sums of squares and they are connected to each other. So we've got total sum of squares, 22.4, and we've sort of sliced that up within rounding error uh, into two portions. So the sort of variability in the outcome that's explained by the model, by fitting the model, how much of the, the 22.4 have we explained? And the residual, how much of the 22.4 is still left over, is still kind of error in prediction. <clears throat> but like we saw earlier on, we can't really use totals because they are based on different amounts of information. And that is why all the way along we've been looking at the degrees of freedom. So to recap what we said earlier on, a sum or a total of squared errors depends on the amount of information used. To compute it, if you have more information, you end up with a bigger sum. So we can't really compare sums of squares based on different amounts of information and instead we would want to compute something like an average or mean squared error, which is basically going to give us the amount of error but taking into account how much information was used to calculate it. We've seen that the degrees of freedom quantifies the amount of information used to compute a sum of squares, so this is a reasonable thing to use um, as, a, as a way of kind of equalizing sums of squares so that we can compare them. So we can end up with something called a mean square, which again, just recapping from earlier on, which is the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. So it's kind of like the total amount of error, but um, kind of factoring in how much information um, was used to calculate that total. So that's the mean squared error. So you can convert the sums of squares that we've just talked about into mean squared. And in particular, you can work out the mean squared residual. So this is the average amount of error in the model. So this is kind of like how badly the model fits on average. So for these data, we take our sum of squares of 9.14 and divide it by eight, the degrees of freedom, which gives us a value of 1.14. And we can also look at the model mean squared error so this is kind of the average improvement from fitting the model so how much better the model is at predicting the outcome than the mean on average so how well the model fits on average and for these data we take our sum of squares of 13.25 and divide by 1 which gives us 13.25 so we can compare these values so we can kind of see that the on average how well the model fits is sort of a value of 13.2 and how badly the model fits on average is a value of one so it kind of fits much better than it doesn't if you see what I mean so one way we can test model fit is by using these mean squares and in particular something called an F statistic and this is literally the ratio of the mean square for the model and the mean square residual so it's kind of like it I it's a good to shit ratio basically telling you how well the model fits compared to how badly it fits. So for these data, we've got these two values, we get an F statistic of 11.62. So that's telling us how much better the model fits than it doesn't fit, if that makes sense. So how good it is relative to how bad it is. So for example, for the model we've actually fitted here, predicting belief from repetition, you might end up with a table something like this and you can significance test this F. So you can you know, see we've got our degrees of freedom, sums of squares for our model and our residual. So all the values in this table, you can check back on the slides and see where they come from. We get this F value of 11.61, which 
because in, in R it's using kind of more precise values, there's a slight rounding difference between the value that I've got because my calculations are all to two decimal places. And you significance test it. And if that p-value is less than your critical value, then happy days, your model is a significant fit. The other way you can test model fit is using something called R square, and this uh, works with the raw sums of squares, and it's just the proportion of variance accounted for by the model. So it's just the model sum of squares, which remember is, you know, in total how well the model fits relative to how much variability there was in the first place. So it's literally just kind of the, the proportion of the pi that is the model sum of squares. And in this case, it's 0.59, which is actually huge. So you can convert this to um, a percentage by um, essentially times it by 100. So it's basically saying that of the variability in perceived truth scores, um, repetition accounts for 59% of them. 59% uh, of it, which is absolutely massive. <clears throat> you can also look at something called the adjusted R square, which is an estimate of the R square in the population. And basically, you just ideally want that R square to be similar to the R square for the data. So, again, looking at what pops out of the computer, you'll get a table like this, which tells you your R square value. which matches what we've just calculated up here. Um, also, incidentally, uh, this statistic is your F statistic, and these are the degrees of freedom for that F statistic. So you get the F statistic in there as well, and this is the adjusted R square, which is very similar to the, uh, the R square for the data. Okay, so an example of measuring fit, we've looked at this example before, so it does playing hard to get work. Uh, if you remember this study from a previous lecture, we basic, uh, they basically had heterosexual participants conversing with an opposite sex confederate over instant messenger for about eight minutes. And the variables they measured were uh, in the final message, they coded the final message for interest or rom expressions of romantic interest, which could range from zero to four. So the, the most expressions of romantic interest was four in an instant message. Uh, they also had measures of how hard to get the participant thought the other person was, the, how hard they thought the hard to get they thought the confederate was, and their perceived mate value. So did they think the um, confederate that they were messaging was kind of a high value mate or not. So this is the model from the actual data. Uh, we've looked at these before in a previous lecture, but I just want to illustrate the fact that we can test the overall fit of this model using this F statistic. So we can get a table out like this, which again, this is our model. So this is using hard to get as a predictor. This is the residual or the error in the model. So we've got degrees of freedom, sums of squares, the resulting mean squares, and eventually an F, which you can then compute a p-value for. So in this case, the model is not a significant fit of the data. I mean, it's borderline. <clears throat> um, but yeah, essentially, the model's not a significant fit. So using hard to get as a predictor of interest does not significantly improve um, our ability to predict um, expressions of romantic interest. And you get the same information out of this table if you're using R. So this is our F statistic with its respective degrees of freedom and its p-value. But most important, we also get this R square value, which is 0.02, which is pretty small. So that's saying that uh, the ratings of hard to get only explain about 2% of the variance in um, in uh, expressions of interest. It's very small. Okay, we can also extend the linear model to add extra predictors. So in this example that we've just been looking at, looking at predicting expressions of romantic interest, we had hard to get as a predictor. We could now add in mate value to see whether uh, extending the model uh, kind of improves our ability to predict expressions of romantic interest. So this is just showing you what the raw data would look like 
so we've got hard to get on the kind of one of the axes. Uh, we've got mate value along this axis here and our outcome is still expressions of romantic interest. So we can sort of express this as a 3D scatter plot. What I want to illustrate here is that the, the process of working out fit, so the sums of squares, that process is exactly the same, even though we've added a predictor. All that's different is instead of dealing with a line, we're dealing with a, a plane or a surface. So for example, if we want to work out the total sum of squares, we look at the differences between each observed data point, so each of the dots, and what's predicted by the surface. So we're still just looking at the difference. That surface is at the overall mean of expressions of interest. So we're still just looking at the difference between each data point and the overall mean, exactly the same as when there's one predictor. Then we fit our model. And again, our model now looks like a plane. It's like three dimensional rather than a line, but all other, every, the whole other process just stays the same. So now if we wanna work out the residual sum of squares, we're just looking at the distances between each data point and the plane rather than the line. And again, we would square them and add them up. So the process is exactly the same. This is how much error in prediction is left over when we fit our model. And if we wanna look at the model sum of squares, we have our kind of baseline plane and our uh, plane that represents our model. And we would just look at the differences. Uh, this is quite hard to see, I realize. But you just look at the differences between, for each data point, the predicted value from the model and the overall mean in, uh, of expressions of interest. Basically though, the process is exactly the same. Just because a new predictor has been added, all the sums of squares are derived in the same way. So we can again look at overall fit of the model. So when we have two predictors in our model, we get an R square of 0 0.06. So that means we can now ex uh, account for about 6%, 6.4% of the variance in expressions of interest. Our F statistic 4.27 with these degrees of freedom has a p-value of 0 0.016. So overall, including both predictors, our model does significantly improve our ability to predict expressions of interest. So here we would then say the model is a significant fit of the data, whereas it wasn't before. So we can look at what the values of the betas in this model actually are. And this shows us what our model is. So these are our estimates of the Bs, which we can then put up into our model to make further predictions uh, if, you know, if you like. But each of these Bs can be significance tested as well. So we have a test statistic for each B and a significance value for each B. So this tells us that even though the model overall significantly fits the data, actually the variable hard to get is not a significant predictor of expressions of interest, whereas mate value is. And we could also look at the values of the betas themselves and interpret them because as we've seen in previous lectures, you don't necessarily just want to rely on p-values to interpret things. So to interpret these effects, so for example the parameter or the beta uh, for hard to get is 0.126. What this tells us is that as perception of the other person being a hard to get increased by 1, 0.126 more expressions of interest were made when mate value is constant. So this is basically the effect of hard to get on interest adjusted for the effect of mate value. And we can see it's a really small effect. You're just getting, uh, for, you know, bearing in mind the hard to get scale is only like a five point scale. For every shift on that, of one on that five point scale, you're getting 0.126 more expressions of interest. So you'd need like a mammoth, you, you couldn't shift far enough on that scale to get one more expression of interest basically. So not not a very uh, useful predictor. If we look at mate value now, as the perception of mate value increased by one, again on a scale of one to five, 0.386 more expressions of interest were made. This is a significant effect, and this is the effect of mate value on interest adjusted for the effect of playing hard to get. And this is a bigger effect, 
and we can actually compare these uh, these betas because they were both uh, hard to get and mate value were measured on five point scales. But even so, it's still quite a small effect. What it's saying is as you shift one on that five point scale, you get 0.386 more expressions of interest. So you'd have to kind of shift along that scale about three points on the five point scale to get one more expression of interest. So again, even though it's significant, it's not a very dramatic effect. Finally, I just want to talk about how we enter predictors when we have more than one predictor in a model. There's basically three choices. The first and best choice is to enter variables into the model uh, based on theoretical reasons. So this is where the researcher decides which order to enter variables. So typically what you would do is enter predictors that you already know are good predictors of your outcome. And then after you've done that, fit a new model that adds in any kind of new predictors that maybe haven't been looked at before. A second approach is called forced entry, which does make your linear model sound a little bit like a burglar. And in this, you just enter all predictors simultaneously. So you just fit the model with all predictors in one go. Um, bearing in mind that the Bs are dependent on what predictors are in the model, this isn't necessarily a great strategy. And the final and worst option is to use something called a stepwise method. And this is basically where you use a statistical criterion to determine the order in which variables are entered. So in particular, <clears throat> I mean, basically what happens is the, the computer or the, the software fitting the model, it has a look at which of the predictors will make the biggest contribution to uh, explaining the outcome variable. And it puts that variable in first. Having put that variable in, it looks around at the remaining variables that aren't in the model and says, well, of the remaining variables, which one, statistically speaking, is going to make the biggest contribution to predicting the outcome? And it puts that one in. Then it has a look around, says, well, do any of the other variables that I've left out make a statistically uh, meaningful contribution to predicting the outcome? And if the answer is yes, then the next variable gets entered in. This seems like a great idea at face value because you're using a statistical criterion and an objective criterion for determining which order you enter variables into the model. The problem is that the whatever statistic you use is going to vary from sample to sample. So what that means is the order in which variables get entered in your particular sample might be slightly different to the order that they would be entered had you taken a different sample because you know the, stati the statistic would be different in the different samples. And you can also end up in situations where two variables make a really, really similar contribution to predicting the outcome, but one of them has a very, very, very slightly bigger contribution. And so it gets entered first, even though it's only making like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit more of a contribution than another predictor. So you should only really use stepwise methods for exploratory analysis. The best way to kind of illustrate uh, the difference between, say, the stepwise method and the hierarchical method is with a little demonstration. So imagine you're getting ready for school in the morning and on the first day you let a hierarchical model get you dressed. This is what will happen. Now each item of clothing is a predictor and the hierarchical entry method knows based on past experience and research that trousers are the best predictor of the outcome, followed by a top and then some socks. So these are entered into the model first based on known past research. However, maybe you've got some new predictors, but these are still theoretically driven. So you know, for example, that the jumper ought to predict the outcome and so ought to the coat. So these get entered at the end. And finally, the shoe predictors get put into the model, leaving us with, at the end, a beautifully formed linear model. Good work, hierarchical entry. Now on another day, you decide to let a stepwise method get you dressed for school in the morning. This is what happens. The stepwise method knows nothing about the predictors other than their statistical ability to predict the outcome. And the best predictor turns out to be the coat. It's big. It predicts a lot of the outcome. It goes in first. Next up, it turns out that the jumper is statistically speaking the best predictor, so that goes into the model second. 
Then the vest is the third best predictor, so that goes into the model third. There's also some trousers. They make a significant contribution to the model, so they get entered in. And now the shorts, which also add something to the model. But wait, there's more. Turns out that the shoes can add some predictive power to the model, so they get entered in. And then finally, the socks. And what we have at the end of this is a slightly strange linear model. So basically, if you let a stepwise method get you dressed in the morning, you end up looking silly. And the same applies if you use a stepwise method to fit your model. So to sum up, we evaluate the fit of a general linear model using sums of squares. The three types of sums of squares that will crop up again in the, these lectures. Total sum of squares is kind of like the total error in observed scores. The residual sum of squares is kind of the total error in predicted scores, so the total error in the model and SSM is kind of the reduction in error due to the model. We've seen that we can uh, usefully convert these into kind of the average error or mean squared error. And again, we have a mean squared error for the residual, which is kind of the average error in predicted scores or average error in the model, and the mean squared model, which is kind of the average reduction in error. So it's like on average how good the model is. We've seen that R squared is the proportion of variance in observed scores accounted for by the model. We've seen that F is the average variance accounted for by the model compared to the error in prediction. So it's the ratio of kind of how good the model is to how bad it is. We also saw that multiple predictors can be added to a linear model. And when they are, the way the fit is evaluated is basically the same. Um, Bs are interpreted in a very similar way. It's just uh, the change in the outcome associated with a unit change in the predictor. But when the other predictors are held constant, that's the only kind of difference. And other things being equal, enter your predictors based on theory, not based on a stepwise method. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much.